All right, guys, we are back with another Chem Complete lesson, and this time we are doing yet another unknown structure with spectroscopy. So before we get started, brief reminder to head on over to chemcomplete.com where you can support us by checking out the guide that we wrote for these types of uh, problem solving sessions. Now, I will leave a link down below that will take you directly there, or you can head over to chemcomplete.com yourself. You can pick up the guide for a couple of bucks and it is very expansive. It has a walkthrough, tables, a detailed explanation and breakdown for all of this type of uh, material. Now, this is also available on YouTube. I have created an entire walkthrough course on YouTube and that will also be linked down in the description. That's obviously completely free. If you're struggling with any part during this and you don't understand what's going on, just check that out. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we want to do is solve for our degrees of unsaturation. So for degrees of unsaturation, it's two times the number of carbons, which is four plus two. And then oxygens are ignored, so we will subtract the number of hydrogens, eight, divide by two. So if we take a look here, two times four is eight, plus 2 is going to be 10, minus 8 is 2, so 2 divided by 2 is equal to 1 degree of unsaturation, so we have a double bond or a ring. So we know that we have some limitations set up from the start. Let's hop over into the mass spec and see if that has anything to tell us. So we can see the M plus peak at 88 means that the molar mass for this compound is 88 grams per mole. Now we could have done that with a addition of all the elements down here. And then we have two major peaks that we see going on here. Uh, these are very common, a peak at 29 and 57. You'll see that a lot for specific types of functional groups. Now, uh, if you have the guide, you can check your mass spec appendix and check out all the common fragments. 29, so the peak at 29, is almost definitely going to be an ethyl. That's the most common fragment that we see at 29, is a CH3CH2. Now we have another one at 57, and one of the most common fragments we see at 57 is an ethyl ketone. So if we already have an ethyl group, an ethyl ketone could certainly be supported with a CH3CH2 C double bond O. And the fact that we have a C double bond O being proposed here would account for the double bond, the degree of unsaturation. So that's off to a good start. We probably have at least some portion of our structure here, but we need to continue forward to figure out the rest of it. And we do have two oxygens we have to account for, not just one. So next we would head over to the IR. Now, if we look at the IR, there's only one major peak. We don't see anything above 3000, so we can pretty much get rid of carbon-carbon double bonds that have hydrogens attached to any type of alkenes and things of that nature. Uh, but we do have a very clear carbonyl peak at 1744. Now, at 1744, the carbonyl peak in that region is generally considered to be an ester. Now, again, these are rough guidelines when you use the uh, carbonyl basic breakdown for IR because uh, there's so many different types of carbonyl groups. You have aldehydes, ketones, uh, esters, carboxylic acids, etc. But in general, this is suggesting an ester, and we do have to account for a second oxygen. So that seems like it might be something reasonable. And then we would also say that uh, potentially we could have the ethyl group that we were suggesting a moment ago on the other side of that carbonyl. So then the question would be, what's the R? It would probably be, because this is a relatively small molecule, just something like a CH3. Uh, but let's continue forward uh, and gather some more evidence to actually support this. So we come down to the carbon-13. Now, for the carbon-13, we have two types. We have the DEPT in this case, and we also have the proton decoupled, which you could consider your regular C13 NMR. We ignore solvent peaks, so you don't need to worry about the one that says solvent right there. Now, we have some useful information starting right off the bat here, okay? Anything that's usually below 20 is gonna be a CH3, all right? So this first one is most definitely a methyl group, this peak right here. 
Now the depth will show any methylene groups, which is a CH2, as an inverted peak. So we can see the matchup here due to this inversion. That means that this is going to be a CH2. Now this is good because we already stated we have to have an ethyl group most likely due to the mass spec information we saw. So we have a carbon 13 that seems to be supporting that at this point. Now we have another one here, okay? And this one, now that we're getting up close to, let's say about 52 ppm on this third peak, when we're at this area, it could be a methyl or it could be a methene, meaning a CH group. So we're really not sure if this is going to be a CH3 or a CH. Now, if you remember what we said, we can make a prediction because we did say this ester, we're going to need something else on the other side, right? The ester has to be terminal on both ends. So we're, we likely have an ethyl group. That means we probably need a methyl group right here, right? Because if we have a CH, that CH is going to need something else attached to it as well. And that's probably less likely given we only have four carbons to work with and three are accounted for if we're going to have a carbonyl and an ethyl. So this is probably a CH3, but we'll want to confirm that with the proton NMR in a couple minutes. And then the last thing that we look for is this carbonyl right here. Okay, now this is uh, roughly, probably maybe around 175, 176 ppm. And that is the general area that we would expect to find an ester carbonyl. So now this is starting to really take shape. We've got supportive ester carbonyl in both the IR and in the carbon 13. So it's probably going to be an ester based on what we have at this point. Now, the last thing I just want to point out briefly, and you probably gathered this as we went along, we have four peaks in this carbon 13 and there are four carbons. So no symmetry of any sort. And this molecule is going to be uh, unique to itself. There's not going to be any type of uh, replicates. So, if we continue forward, let's go down to the proton NMR. All right, now for the proton NMR, we see a total of three signals. So if you take a look, there's an expansion here for the first two signals. And we can see very clearly that there is a quartet here and there is a triplet here. Now the integration here, okay, it didn't, uh, scan properly is three, two, and three. Now, if you ever had to figure this out yourself, you know something that below the one region is going to be a methyl group. That's pretty much the only thing that shows up there. So then you take the relative heights of the integration. So we're talking about something like this and you compare it. So if you look at the one next to it, it's about two thirds the size. So that's two versus three. And then if you look at the one down around 3.4 ppm, this one is the same integration size as the one over here, right? So when we're talking about the integration, we're looking at the height of this right here. And if you match that, you could pretty much drag it over top of what you've got right here. All right, so it's three, two, three in this case. So this would be a CH3. And if we take a look at it, a triplet means its neighbor should have two protons. So this is CH3 next to a CH2. And then we would expect that CH2 to be right over here. And that shows up as a quartet, which means we've got a CH3 here. All right. Now there's a question. Okay. If we have an ester, we could have one of two choices. So we could have a CH3, CH2, O, and then C double bond O, CH3. Or we could have a CH3, CH2, C double bond O, O, CH3. So the key here is that the oxygen involved with the ester could either be next to the ethyl group or the methyl group. And we're going to need to look at the chemical shift, the PPMs, in order to determine that. And it's fairly obvious in this case. All right, so the last thing we have here is another CH3. And this is the furthest downfield. So here we go. This is the key. All right. Which one of these two is most likely? Well, whatever is next to the oxygen directly 
is going to be the one that's furthest downfield. And so we see the CH3 has more deshielding effects than the CH2. So therefore, the methyl group must be on the oxygen side of the ester, and the ethyl group is over on that ketone side. Okay. Now, we had other evidence of this prior, which is in the mass spec, we saw that peak at 57, and that suggests that we have an ethyl ketone of some sort. Uh, that would not be showing up if that oxygen came in between the carbonyl and the ethyl group. All right. So just to reconfirm, so everybody's on the same page, the final structure that we can confirm here is going to be CH3, CH2, C double bond O, and then O, CH3. And this is supported by all of these specs that we have. So hopefully everybody found this useful. As usual, if you leave comments, I'll get back to you. Uh, remember to throw a like and help out the YouTube algorithm. It'll help boost this material and encourages me to make more for you guys. Uh, subscribe and hit the little bell notification if you want to be up to date throughout the semester anytime I release material, which I'm trying to do weekly. And finally, again, head on over to chemcomplete.com. Even if you don't buy anything, just go support the channel and surf around on the website. We got a lot of stuff over there, including a lot of free resources. You'd be surprised. So until next time, thank you for learning with us and good luck with all of your studies.